Hello and welcome back. In this video, we'll be looking at how to add Lambda authorizers to our serverless framework applications in order to add a little bit of security to our APIs and make sure that not just anybody can use them whenever they want. So let's go ahead and download the code for this course if you haven't already. You can find all of this in the GitHub repository listed in the top portion of the screen in the URL bar or in the description found below. You will need the code for this particular video in the 5.3 Adding Lambda Authorizers folder here. You can go ahead and go to Clone or Download and click the Download Zip button here. Once you've done that, you'll need to go into your local operating system, open up all the files, and then make sure you're getting the code inside of 5.3 Adding Lambda Authorizers. In particular, there's a few changes in quite a few different parts of these files, so make sure that you're going through and either copying the entire project over and then importing some API values that I'll talk about later on, or just referencing this file by file and making sure yours looks equivalent if you wanna follow along with this course. Now let's talk about what we're actually doing in this particular video. Let me go back and give you a demonstration. Currently, inside of serverless jams, we hit those different API endpoints that we deployed using the serverless framework. Now, you'll remember those if we run serverless info, and you look for the post and the get endpoints of our service. So I had something like this to get the vote counts in our service, and if we go into the inspector here, and we look at the console, maybe we refresh the page here, and look at the network tab, you'll see that if we search for this particular endpoint, let's just look for the very front of this part right here, we have one git request that's made out to this endpoint to retrieve this data, and then this allows us then to load it up for these different buttons down here and tell us how many votes are on each of these songs. And we also have some extra data that we haven't trimmed out of our database yet, because that was used for testing and just making sure that it works. But the data that we are actually using is related to the Coderitis song, also to the Dynamo song, and the Stateless song here to determine how popular these are. Now, getting this data isn't maybe the most important thing we need to worry about securing. But what about voting on this data? In the previous video, we said we had to log in in order to vote on that data, right? We had to go here and click Login with Google, and then we got redirected back to this page and we could finally vote on these songs. Well, I have some bad news for us. This isn't the most secure implementation of actually trying to prevent people from voting through your API. Because we could just do something like go into the source code and look for this post endpoint right here that we're looking at, and then go over to something like Postman, and while we could use the git endpoint all we wanted to go and get that data back out, we could also use the post endpoint to vote as many times as we wanted without even logging into the application. Now, this might present a problem as we're trying to secure the API endpoints that we're working with. So in order to fix this issue, we're going to need to go and add authorizers to this application to make sure that you can only vote if you're signed in. In the next video, we'll talk about how you can add even one more layer of security to make sure that people also have permissions that are required in order to take actions on particular API endpoints. So let's go ahead and get started with this process. The first thing we'll need to do before we even change the values in our code and change our code around is actually to get set up with a little bit more stuff inside of Auth0. So let's go back to our browser now and go over to the Auth0 dashboard. We're going to be creating an API that we can use to work with Lambda authorizers. I already have one here that I've set up in the past, but let's create a new one from scratch. Let's call this serverless API 2.0. Now I'm also going to give this API an identifier. One thing we could do if we wanted to is actually to take the same value from our endpoint here and paste that in. However, that's not required, and it can also just be useful to give it the name that you might push it to in production. So if you're changing it to an actual custom domain name and you have some of this information on the end there, that might also be worthwhile. In this particular case, I'm just going to end up using the very beginning of my API gateway endpoint here just so I can keep track of it and make sure it's the appropriate endpoint. Now I'm gonna to toss that identifier in there. And the last setting I could have in this initial page is what signing algorithm I'd wanna use. There's just two options here that will allow me to pick from essentially different ways of making sure that if this API algorithm is signing something cryptographically, that it's going to be who we say it's going to be. I'm gonna stick with the default of RS-256 for right now and then click create. 
Now you could go through the entire process of choosing your own JSON web token library to decode some of the stuff that's going on here and work with whatever implementation in either C Sharp, Node.js, PHP, or a variety of other languages you'd like. But in this case, I've already done this whole process, so you don't need to do too much more in this section. You can just copy along with the code that I'll be showing you in a moment. Now, the next step we need to do is actually go to the settings section here. And we need to make sure that we're copying the values that you see in the identifier section, because we'll need this to hook up into this API configuration and encode and decode things appropriately to verify people are who they say they are. So I'm gonna copy this identifier right here. And then we're gonna be able to go back to our code and start making some changes. So let's go back now. The first thing I'll do is I'll copy all of the code from the downloads folder to this folder here so we can start to change things file by file. So I'm gonna go ahead and do copy from tilde slash downloads. And for this particular demo, we're inside of serverless jams master here. And we need to look for 5.3. So let's copy everything inside of 5.3 and let's copy it into the current directory in a new folder called v5.3. Now it looks like I have to copy this recursively so I can go back to the very beginning of this line here and instead of saying just copy, I can do copy with dash r. And now I should have this new folder here in version 5.3 with all the code that I'll be transforming my code over to. Now you can do it this way, or you can completely overwrite everything you've currently got. Just remember that if you do that, it'll remove any of the API key values that you had in your files like authconfig.json or inside of other configuration. For example, in the app.js file where you had already pasted in your API endpoints. So let's go ahead file by file and look at some of the front end code that we'll need to change to work with this new API. First, let's go to the authconfig.json file. We already have the domain and the client ID here, but in order to start working with Lambda authorizers, we're actually gonna to need to add one new value here. And that value is called an audience. Now this audience variable here is gonna be a string and it's gonna be identical to the value of the audience for our API. So it's that API value that if we go back here and look for this identifier, this is what we're gonna be using in this particular case. Now audiences for Auth0 aren't always gonna be this particular value, so keep that in mind and make sure you're using the one that you've configured inside of your own Auth0 account. Now the next step is to make sure that this is going to be also populated in a few other parts of the code. You'll see that we just finished that inside of, if we go to front end, authconfig.json, it's gonna match the configuration in our current setup, but we're also gonna to need to go into a different file and actually compare some of those changes. So let's look at auth0.js next. So let's select both of those and click compare. And the main change you'll see here is that there's this new audience value here. And this is gonna give our Auth0 client the proper information it needs to sign and verify all of the different information surrounding our users inside of ID tokens that we send over to our backend for that verification. So to make this change, you can just go into auth0.js and on this line here, right underneath domain, we can just add in an audience here. And let's go ahead and do config.auth audience and add a comma there and save that. Now, if I wanna double check that I'm implementing this correctly, I can also just do this one more time in VS Code and it looks like it should be identical right now. So that's great for me. Inside of the rest of Auth0.js, you'll notice that I don't have any other changes. It's really just how we're creating this Auth0 client in the front end and making sure that it has that audience value there. So I can close this out now and close out both versions of it as well as the Auth0 config as well as the authconfig.json file. Now, the next change we'll need to look at is inside of app.js. So I'm gonna select that here and also select the version of it that we're transitioning to. And I'll compare both of these here. Now, this change is kind of expected because I don't know what your API endpoint will be. So just make sure that you've pasted in your actual vote endpoint and your git votes endpoint into your final version of the code, regardless of if you're copying this over or if you're going file by file like I am right now. So we can ignore that for right now because I want to assume you've done it. The next change is inside of the vote for song function. And you'll see that instead of launching directly into a post request to send information over to the vote endpoint, we're starting with this ID token value that we're getting from this auth0 method called get token silently. 
what this will do is it'll get us the information of an ID token for a user, and then we can use that ID token later on, actually down here in the headers, to prove that this user is a real user by sending it to the backend and having the backend verify this value. So this is where we're generating it from, and you'll see how we verify it on the backend in just a moment. So make sure you're making these changes too. I'd say probably the easiest way to make sure you're doing that is actually in this case just to copy directly from the vote for song function in the new file and then go to your old file here in app.js and find that same function if we look for vote for song and replace it with the rest of that code there. Now this is going to again go through and use that method to put that ID token in there and send it along to our backend. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. It might not be clear on what we're doing quite yet because this is just setting the front end up to work with the backend changes that we're about to make. Now let's go ahead and just set up that front end locally so we can take a look at what's happening inside of it and how that's changing the values inside of the details that are returned from Auth0. So I'm going to change directories into the front end and then do python 3-m for module http.server and this should run this front end locally and I can go back over to my browser and then load up localhost 8000. So let's do that now. And this should load the locally running version of this application. So now let's go to the console here and let's test out a line of our code actually, where we use the ID token as the results of the get token silently method of the auth0 client that we create in our front end. So I'm gonna go here and paste that in. It looks like currently it doesn't work. The reason for this is because login is required for us to actually use this method. So let's go through that process really quick and press login. Login with Google, because I've already created this account here. And it is possible that if we haven't already logged in with Google and we're using the local host value that we might see an additional screen in between there. So just keep that in mind. Now I'm gonna go ahead and use that code that I pasted again. And now we should be able to get that ID token. So let's go ahead and console.log the ID token that we just defined. Now, this is what it looks like. And this is kind of confusing because we can't really read this as a human. So the way we might interpret this is actually to take something like the jwt.io website and to copy and paste that JSON web token, which is what you just saw, right into here in the encoded value. Now this site is gonna decode everything for us and it'll tell us a little bit about what's inside of it. So you'll see here that we have a bit of information about the user. In this case, we have this sub value, which is the subscriber value sometimes known as. It also talks about the different audiences that this token belongs to that might use this token. Now we have the API ID audience that we had from Auth0 included in this, this identifier. And this is really important in order to use it and decode it on the backend. We also see this other value, which is this user info box here. And this could be used to actually get us information about this user on the backend as well. So if we wanted to, for example, send a request to this particular endpoint using the values that we have inside of this, we could get back the basic information about the user from the email to the basic scopes that might be associated with the profile later on. We're not implementing those right now, so don't too worry too much about it. But this is how the ID token works and how we need it to look in order to send it along to our backend and get it verified. Now, it's really important to point out here that if you're not getting something that has three different parts separated by two different periods here, and when you paste it into something like JWT, having it nicely color highlighted for us in the red section, the purple section, and the blue section, the I guess what this would be is the teal section here, then make sure that you're setting the audience correctly because that's a pretty common mistake to set the audience value is something like the ID of the API or even the actual ID of the front end application. You might see something like this as the client ID being used as the audience. There are sometimes appropriate reasons to do that, but in this particular case, we really just need to make sure that the API that we're creating is using this identifier when we're sending it over to that API. So now that we've confirmed that that's working as expected and that localhost is outputting that value, I'm going to go back to our backend and take a look at some more changes we need to make in order to deal with those tokens being sent along into our API requests. Because right now what's happening is we're sending these tokens that we're getting from Git token silently and the value that we saw that looks just like this along in a bearer authorization header with HTTP 
So in order to get that and decode it, we're going to need to make a few changes on our back end as well. Let's do that in the next video. Thank you.